Reaching Prestige Master in Black Ops 3 Zombies is one of the longest grinds in Call of Duty's history, but have you ever wondered how fast someone could complete that grind? What's the fewest amount of games it takes to go from level 1 all the way to Prestige Master? There's only one way to find out. Starting at level 1 Prestige 0 means important sandbox elements like weapon customization are entirely inaccessible, and gobblegums are heavily limited. This greatly influences which maps I play and when, which is why I started this challenge on the Giant. The fastest way to get through rounds on the giant is by training in the spawn room, so I decided to use a KRM with Thunderwall to easily deal with Hellhounds, and use an RK5 with Deadwire as my primary killing machine. This is a mistake, but we'll come back to it later. For perks, I went with Quick Revive, Juggernaug, Speed Cola, and Double Tap, and after spending way too much time at the mystery box for monkey bombs, I was ready to go for a high round. Speaking of high rounds, it's about time I clue you into how long this game needs to be. Each prestige contains one 1,375,000 XP, and to reach Prestige Master in as few games as possible, I would ideally earn all of that XP in a single game. Luckily, the amount of XP you need to Prestige lines up almost perfectly with the amount of XP you earn by reaching round 100. So this isn't a video about reaching Prestige Master, but instead a video about reaching round 100 on almost every Black Ops 3 map. Surprise! Except, there's a catch. There are a few methods for climbing rounds like running traps that don't earn any XP, and unlike most high round attempts you'll see on YouTube, I won't be spamming Mega Gobblegums every 30 seconds because that's pay to win. And also boring. In fact, I won't even have a strong lineup of classic Gobblegums until I'm a few maps in because I'm starting each game from level 1. Those are all important details that separate this challenge from a typical round 100, but the biggest difference between this and other round 100 videos you've seen on YouTube is the runner. Me. I am not and have never been a high round player. The highest round I've reached in Black Ops 3 is a round 88 Revelations game that I played all the way back in 2016. That game is now 7 years old, and I haven't even thought about attempting another high round since. High rounding isn't the way I like to play zombies, but it's the skill I need to learn to complete this challenge. And considering this was my first high round attempt in Black Ops 3 in nearly a decade, the challenge started off really well. I took my first down on round 31 before getting monkey bombs out of the box, but I didn't down again until round 63. It was a pretty long time between downs, which I can't say about my third down on round 66. Hellhounds might be paper thin in Black Ops 3, but their speed still makes them a threat. That down took my last quick revive, but on the bright side I could pick up Mule Kick and a pack a punch to Vesper for a third alternate ammo type. And that brings us to the mistake I mentioned earlier. Deadwire is by far the best alternate ammo type in Black Ops 3, but it does have a downside not many people talk about. If you did didn't already know, not every AAT in Black Ops 3 can spawn power-ups. For example, Blast Furnace and Thunder Wall can spawn power-ups, while Fireworks cannot. Some of them are a little weird. Turn can spawn power-ups if a zombie U-turn is the one to drop it, but enemies that the turned zombie kills cannot spawn power-ups. And then there's Deadwire, whose ability to spawn power-ups is entirely map-dependent. Deadwire can spawn power-ups on any Black Ops 3 map except for Shadows of Evil, Verruckt, Shinonuma, and because of course, the giant. What do these four maps have in common? That's right, absolutely nothing. So by using Deadwire, I was cheating myself out of insta-kills and death machines to kill zombies even faster, max ammos to restock on monkey bombs, and double points to make late game gobblegums more affordable. Anyway, I'm able to continue with the 3 AAT strategy for another 10 rounds before a mid-round gobblegum run puts an end to my first game at round 77. And although I was far away from my round 100 goal, this is a game game I'm actually really proud of. Considering this was my first high round attempt on Black Ops 3 in nearly 7 years, and that I didn't have any weapon attachments or useful gobblegum other than in plain sight, the game went about as well as I could have hoped. There is a catch. If you've never gone for round 100 before, you probably don't know that round 50 isn't halfway to round 100. Because each round gets longer and longer as more and more zombies spawn per round, the halfway point is actually somewhere between round 75 and 80. I ended this game at level 23 with 12,000 kills and 77 completed rounds, earning me 715,000 XP. 715,000 XP of the 1,375,000 I need to prestige. I need another 660,000. I am halfway through my first prestige. There are 10 more left. We might be here a while. 
For my second crack at the giant, I had a few more toys to play with. While I'm obviously trying to get through every prestige in a single game, playing multiple games does have some advantages. The first advantage is because I'm restarting at a higher level, I have some new gobblegums to play with. Swordflay is going to make getting through the early rounds a little more point efficient, but the real hero is Anywhere But Here. Anywhere But Here is an additional get out of jail free card I'll have alongside In Plain Sight and Monkey Bombs, which should mean mistakes won't be as punishing. But the second advantage is now I can unlock weapon attachments. While I could unlock weapon camos at any time, I can only start unlocking attachments after reaching the weapons unlock level and starting a new game. Attachments like Fast Mags will be so beneficial in future games that it will entirely decide which weapons I use throughout this run and what role they'll fill. It'll also provide little XP boosts for each level, they aren't all that much but every little bit counts. As for weapon rolls, the KRM is now my main weapon for clearing hordes of zombies. The KRM will be extremely valuable in future maps, so I want to level it up as quickly as possible. As such, the KRM now has Blast Furnace, and the less important RK5 has Thunderwall. Other than that, the strategy is exactly the same. After 48 rounds and nearly 2 hours of flawless gameplay, the KRM was at the max level. And that means it was time to switch it out for everyone's favorite weapon, the M8A7? Surprisingly enough, the M8A7 comes up a lot in these high round strategies, so I put Blast Furnace on that and kept Thunderwall on the RK5. That took me to round 61 before my first down of the game. After what is by my standard a long game, I do start to make bad decisions. You know, I wonder if this is something I realized while I was actually playing. Yeah, my movement is starting to drop off the long- how, how long has it been? Three hours. That appears to be fucking- yeah, I was about to say three hours seems to be about my breaking point. Huh, I guess, uh, I guess that's a yes. I'll blame myself here too, so long as we can all agree that Hellhounds shouldn't trigger alternate ammo types. If I have Thunderwall here, that's an avoidable down. It's annoying, but we move on. At round 64, I reached the max weapon level for both the M8A7 and the RK5, but after ending the round prematurely, I can only replace the M8A7. The Vesper is another weapon that isn't super popular, but it does come up a lot in the high round strategies going forward. That gets me through to the end of round 65, and this time I save a zombie to get another weapon. I'm going to need to keep him alive because the weapon I want next is in the mystery box. It took a hefty chunk of change, but after nearly 15 minutes, I finally have my whale. Like, I could rank up the dingo. I'm never gonna use it in this cha- oh thank god, finally got it. While the ICR isn't a wall buy on the giant, it is a wall buy on many of the DLC maps, and a few have optimal placements for high rounds. After reaching the max level on the Vesper on round 71, I replaced it with a VMP with Thunderwall and moved Blast Furnace over to my ICR to focus on its level. Speaking of levels, during round 71 I hit level 35, but I'm not done yet. I still have to complete level 35 before I have the ability to prestige. The first part of this challenge is 54,000 XP away from completion, and after finishing an easy Hellhound round on round 72, the climb to complete level 35 starts out poorly. Uh, okay, okay. We're dead. Yeah. Now that I'm all out of quick revives, I pick up Mule Kick and get a pack a punch scooter with turned as my third weapon. At the start of round 74, I am 22,000 XP away from the finish line, but I need to be careful. Without quick revive, one mistake and this game is over. As the round goes on, I am constantly checking my level to see if I can take my long awaited sigh of relief. 1300 XP, come on! The next Blast Furnace is probably gonna be what does it, if not the one after. Seventy-five! Twenty-five! Hey! <laughs> we did it! Yay! Now that I'm at max rank, I'm free to pursue round 100 without worrying about missing the XP threshold. I could quit and save myself some time, but reaching round 100 would be nice for the sense of accomplishment, and the weapon attachments I'll unlock in the process will be a great quality of life boost for future runs. So now is a perfect time to be abandoned by God. Uh, uh hello? What the fuck was that? The game just froze and I died. That is some bullshit. 
That is some bullshit. Of all the ways to die in a video game, this might be the worst one. I've already had seven other deaths so far, but whether it was an error forced by game mechanics I like or dislike, or unforced errors because I'm an idiot, there are things I could have done to avoid them. Not this one. This one was entirely unavoidable. Game over. And after 9 hours and 42 minutes, Prestige Zero is over. After you prestige, the game will give you a permanent unlock token that you can use to permanently unlock one weapon or gobblegum for future prestiges. I only earn one of these per prestige, so I have to think really carefully about what I want to unlock for the rest of them. The first permanent unlock token is a no-brainer decision, and it's for a gobblegum that I haven't even shown off yet. Alchemical Antithesis is unlocked at level 35 and is more powerful than a lot of the pay-to-win gums. This gobblegum will convert every 10 points you earn into a single bullet for a full minute, with two activations. With regular weapons, this is strong for sure, but not exactly game-breaking, but uses it on a wonder weapon and runs are shortened by hours. And that's exactly what I'll be doing in every future game, including Prestige 1. After finishing the simplest map in this challenge, it was time to move on to the most complex. It might be a little surprising to see Origins so early, but after unlocking Alchemical with my last Prestige token, I already had everything I needed for this game. The game started out with all the typical Origin setup stuff. I got the upgraded Ice Staff, Golden Shovel and Helmet, 1-inch Punch, and G-Strikes. It took about 20 rounds to get all of that stuff, and then another 27 to get all the extra perk slots I wanted. I would have gotten all the perks sooner, but uh... Well, ah, there we go. It is right here. Motherfucker. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, sometimes I can't see very well. But once I found that last red dig site, I could focus solely on the high round strategy. And that strategy is actually really simple. All I need to do is stand at the bottom of the fire tunnel and shoot a charged ice staff shot at this spot to kill any zombies spawning at the bottom of the tunnel or coming down the tunnel's entrance. I also have a kudo with turned that I can use to speed things up a little bit, and if I get into trouble, I can go through the portal in the crazy place for a quick reset. This is a very easy strategy. So, naturally, I leave the fire tunnel and die almost immediately. No, And because it's me playing... Fuck. I just can't do anything in peace, huh? Thankfully I can rebuy all of my perks after that and continue the strategy, but let's rewind a little bit. What the hell was I doing outside of the fire tunnel? Ammo management is a big part of every high round strategy, and Origins is no different. Beyond random max ammos from zombies and my alchemical gobblegums, the best way to get consistent max ammos on Origins is through the Templar rounds. If you haven't played Origins before, these rounds start with a group of Templar zombies attacking one of the six generators around the map, and if you kill them, they'll spawn a max ammo. The trick is that they'll only spawn if four or more generators are on at the same time. So what you can do is keep three generators generators on while you have ammo, and then once you start running low, you can turn on the fourth and get a free max ammo from the Templars once the round flips. This is something I have to think about throughout the entire run. And as you've probably put together, I had three generators on when I left the fire tunnel, the round ended, and by the time the Panzers spawned in, it was already too late. Definitely could have survived if I played it differently, but it is what it is. I was able to continue this strategy up until the 80s when I started getting sloppy. I was over four hours into this game and I was feeling it. I got very sloppy with the timing and shot placement of my ice staff and that resulted in the inevitable. Uh oh. What? Are you fucking me? Are you- I'm trapped. I'm trapped. I can't move. And they're not moving. Oh no. What? God fuck. The total time between the first and final hit. 24 frames. In a 60 frames per second recording, that is 4 tenths of a second to react. That run was far from over. Sure, the quick revive machine had disappeared by that point, but you can get additional revives through the Wonderfizz machine. This run could have gone the distance, but right there, I never stood a chance.
Setting up for my second attempt thankfully went a lot quicker this time. All the main elements came together just like last time, but I managed to get all 8 perks by round 25 and could start the high round strategy before the 70 minute mark. The strategy itself didn't change much between games. All I did was equip some slightly different gobblegums and switch out the Boom Hilda for an ICR with Deadwire. The Boom Hilda was originally a Panzer counter, but the Ice Staff was so good that the Boom Hilda never got used. The ICR isn't all that helpful in the grand scheme of things either, and the wall buy is really far away but if I can earn a few weapon levels with it here, I can potentially save a lot of time in the future. I took my first down on round 59 because apparently I don't learn from my mistakes, and the pattern of taking multiple downs at a time continued into this game as well. But a couple rounds later, I finally reached the experience cap for Prestige 1. All that's left now is to try and make it to round 100. For a while, it was going really well. Round 100 was within sight. And then, on round 95, Something broke. My ice staff isn't charging. Holding the right trigger does nothing. I tried switching to my other weapons, but I cannot find a way out. Switching back to the ice staff somehow fixed whatever was broken, but it was too late. Are you fucking kidding me? Deploy Maxis go straight for Jug. What? I deployed Maxis! He was out! He was not on my D-pad! The game fucked me again. Bad luck seems to come in pairs. Whether it's all 8 downs on Origins coming in 4 condensed pairs, or both prestige ending downs being squarely on the game's shoulders, it's a pattern that is consistent as it is unexplainable. Round 95 should be a tremendous accomplishment. That's the highest round I've reached in Black Ops 3, and it's a higher round than most Zombies players will ever reach. For my second ever high round attempt on this map, this should be a massive success. And yet, it's hard not to think about what could have been, what should have been. It just slipped away. Revelations is widely considered one of the easiest high rounds in the mode's entire history, so I had high hopes for this one. The setup for this map is almost entirely luck-based, because everything you need is from the mystery box. For this strategy, I need the Apothecan Servant, Thunder Gun, Little Arnies, and Ragnaroks, all from the mystery box. Thankfully, the luck started off strong with the Ragnarok Sun Round 10, which allowed me to take advantage of my new Gobblegum. With my Prestige 1 token, I unlocked the Arsenal Accelerator Gobblegum, which charges your Specialist weapon faster. I couldn't find exact numbers on how much faster you charge your Specialist with Arsenal, but with how often we're going to be using the Ragnaroks for this high round, it will be very useful. The luck continued with the free wall run perk at the Dorizon Drax section of the map. Stamina up isn't going to help with the high round strategy itself, but it's a nice quality of life bonus for the setup phase. Speaking of perks, I went with a classic BO3 combination of Quick Revive Juggernaug and Widow's Wine for self-preservation, and then I picked up Mule Kick as my fourth. This will allow me to hold both the Apothecan Servant and Thunder Gun alongside a weapon with an alternate ammo type. The good luck kept rolling with a Thunder Gun on round 12, Little Arnie's on round 18, and the Apothecan Servant on round 21. I have everything I need out of the box, but we're not done yet. I still need to upgrade all of my weapons. For my Thunder Gun and alternate ammo type weapon, this is as simple as sticking it in the Pack-a-Punch machine, but the Apothecan Servant is a little different. Before I can stick it in the Pack-a-Punch machine, I need to shoot these five random rocks floating in the sky to upgrade the Pack-a-Punch or something. I don't know, this map is weird. This took me an embarrassing amount of time, since I haven't done this in years, and a lot of these rocks are really hard to see. Even in editing, I tried looking for some of them, and cannot find them. And since some of the visual effects didn't register, I'm starting to think this might be a render distance problem, or maybe a problem with the PC port of BO3 as a whole. I never had this problem when I was playing on console, so if anyone has any idea of what's going on here, leave a comment because it was really annoying. Oh, and I took my first down while doing this because I'm a dumbass. Thankfully, didn't lose any of my wonder weapons with Mule Kick, so we're good to go. I found the last rock at the end of that round and pack punched my Apothecan Servant, and after rebuying all of my perks, I decided to audible into something I I've never done before, which is acquiring the God Mask. If you didn't already know, Revelations and Garage Krovi both have masks that you can earn by doing challenges in your game. And on Revelations, the best mask by far is the Apothecon Mask. When this mask is equipped, players will have increased sprint duration, deal 50% more damage to all enemies, reduce damage taken by 33%, and give the player an additional hit's worth of health. This mask combined with Juggernaut gives the player 10 hits of health before they go down, and with two wonder weapons, little arm 
Eternities and Ragnaroks? That should be all but impossible. You can sort of see why the Apothecon Mask is colloquially known as the God Mask, and actually earning it is fairly straightforward. When you're in the Pack-a-Punch room, you need to wait for a thick layer of green gas to fill this room. Once that happens, you need to stand inside this green liquid and kill 15 Parasites, 5 Enslaved Keepers, 15 Spiders, 10 Apothecon Furies, 50 Regular Zombies, and 3 Margwas. Once that's done, you will hear an audio cue and can go to the Keynoter Totem section of the map and pick up the God Mask. This was a little annoying to do since the green gas comes and goes periodically and I'm not patient enough to hold a zombie at the end of a round and wait for it to reappear, so it took until the end of round 36 to kill my last Margwa and finally pick up the God Mask. Now all that's left to do is get into the high round strategy, which essentially boils down to spamming all the overpowered gear I just spent two hours collecting. This spot here in Verrucht has the fastest spawns in the entire map, and that's going to make the most of every wonder weapon shot I take. The strategy starts with the Ragnaroks going in this little corner here to kill everything on the right side of the map as quickly as possible. Once the Ragnaroks run out, you need to pick them up immediately and shoot the Apothecan Servant. This Apothecan Servant shot will kill everything that gets close and recharge your Ragnaroks. Once the zombies reach their max speed, it will take two shots to recharge your Ragnaroks without Arsenal Accelerator and one shot with, which is huge for ammo preservation. Alchemical is definitely still king, but if you don't have it, Arsenal is the second best thing to have by far. I also have an HVK with turn to kill zombies on my left since they take longer to reach both the Ragnaroks and Apothecan Servant's blast radius, which further speeds up the rounds and helps preserve ammo. And if a Panzer or Margwa spawns, the Thunder Gun can take either of them out really quickly. The rest of this run can go relatively quickly if I play my cards right, but I have been here before. Seven years ago when I attempted a Revelations round 100, I fell just 12 rounds short. This time, it can be different. It has to. On round 96, I reached the experience cap for Prestige 2. All I needed to do was finish these final four rounds. So I did. Is this round? We got it! That was round! <laughs> I don't know where the last zombie was, but that's round. I'm just gonna go one more round because I'm pretty sure the change to round survived was Black Ops 4, but I'm just gonna be extra careful here. Round 101. Seven years of baggage was unpacked in five and a half hours. A goal finally achieved after eight full years of Black Ops 3 and 12 full years of my zombies playing career. But that was only one map. There are still another eight to come. After Revelations, I was on top of a mountain, but every peak is followed by a valley, and that valley was Moon. This game starts out in Area 51, where I get lucky and get the Juggernaug spawn. If you didn't know, this area can spawn either Juggernaug or Speed Cola at the start of the game, and will switch between the two every time the player revisits the area. From there, I can pick up Juggernaug, teleport to the moon, pick up Quick Revive, and after turning on the power, get Widow's Wind and Double Tap. From there, I need to get Gersh Devices and the Wave Gun out of the box, which is probably going to take a while. I have, I have bad history with this gun. Oh, we got Gersh, let's go. Alright, if we can get Wave Gun here, we're set. Yo, no way, oh my god. I said that expecting it to not happen, and I'd make a funny joke about it, but we got the Wave Gun. What are the odds of that happening? I wasn't able to find the exact odds for every weapon in the mystery box, but I've heard enough speedrunners complain about box luck to know I got very lucky. I'm sure that luck will continue throughout the rest of the run. Uh, 
Okay, I didn't want to kill the astronaut there, but that's fine. Also, what the hell was that noise? I'm going to assume an excavator is about to go off. Oh, it's already going. I didn't even hear it. I did not hear any indication that was about to happen. Oh, it's because I have voices turned off. Oh, I forgot. So I should explain something about my games. I like to play with the voices off when I'm recording videos. If I leave them on, my voice ends up having to compete for space with whatever characters I happen to be playing as in any map, which I think makes for worse videos. It's a subtle thing, but the little things are everything. That voice fader turns off my character's voice, as well as the announcer's voice, any verbal noises the zombies make, and apparently the voice of whoever announces that an excavator is going to slam into the map. These excavators are giant death traps, and a big part of playing Moon properly is managing these environmental hazards. And by turning off voices, I, I couldn't really do that. But I still got really lucky! The high round strategy takes place in an area that can be hit by an excavator, which would have ended the run instantly. So thank god I noticed this issue now, and thank god this excavator hit tunnel 6 instead. So voices are unfortunately going to be on for the rest of the map. Let me know in the comments if you even noticed the difference between between having them on or off. I'm genuinely curious. Where was I? Oh, right, the high round strategy. If you enter the back of Tunnel 11 from the power room and keep the door to the rest of Tunnel 11 closed, the zombies are limited to one of two spawn points, one barricaded window and one hole in the ceiling. These spawns are insanely fast, but if you shoot this part of the wall with the wave gun, you can hit both spawns and instantly kill every zombie on the map. This strategy burns through ammo extremely quickly, but there's a contingency plan. The first is, of course, alchemical, but the second makes use of the Gersh devices and the hacker. As soon as any power-up spawns, you need to throw a Gersh device to get the zombies off you, and then you can hack the power-up to turn it into a max ammo. The hacker makes alchemical far less necessary than prior maps, so for most of the game, I'll be running either in plain sight or the gobblegum I used my Prestige 2 token on. Anywhere but here will teleport the player to a random part of the map when used. For all intents and purposes, is they get an FGL free card, and with a strategy this fast, it's one I'm happy to have. The only other things you have to worry about are the excavator and the Astronaut. The excavators are simple to deal with. The only places on the map zombies are spawning is right in front of you, so you have a straight shot to the spawn to hack an excavator. You might have to throw a Gersh to get the time and space in the spawn room to actually hack them, but max ammos are such a non-issue that it's always worth using one if you have to. The astronaut is a little bit trickier to deal with. The only path the astronaut has to you is through the power room, so if you throw trip mines in this hallway, you'll be able to hear them explode and know he's close. Now, the trip mines obviously won't kill him, they barely kill zombies, but once you hear a trip mine go off, you can throw a Gersh device and switch to a weapon with dead wire to instantly kill the astronaut. Also, some of you eagle-eyed viewers might have noticed, my perks are different while running this strategy. That's because I already had a run-in with the astronaut while finishing up the setup phase that led to my first down of the run. And this is where I get frustrated with Moon. Remember when this run started and I said, This game starts out in Area 51 where I get lucky and get the Juggernaut spawn. If you didn't know, this area can spawn either Juggernaut or Speed Cola at the start of a game and will switch between the two every time the player revisits the area. Yeah, well that causes problems once you lose a perk. If I go down and lose all my perks, I need to return to Area 51 twice to get Speed Cola and then Juggernaut. Now, that wouldn't be a problem if I could just go to Area 51, but once you leave Area 51, these giant red gates will surround the teleporter and prevent you from returning for a couple of rounds. This slows the game to a snail's pace, since running the high round strategy is extremely dangerous without Juggernaut, and your reloads are often too slow without Speed Cola. When this happens, I have to move to the Biodome and train there, which is a lot slower, but more importantly when this happens, I get pissed. God fucking damn it. I hate Moon. I hate it so much. I can't get to Pack Punch, but it also means not only can I not get to Jug because it's timed, I cannot get to Jug because the next time I go there, it's going to be Speed Cola. And I have to go all the way back to fucking spawn. And I can't use Area 51 as a shortcut. Why did... How did this map come to be? 
Did they make a single good decision when making it? I honestly don't know. There is no map that makes me saltier than Moon. Thankfully, that astronaut encounter was a one-time mistake, and I never had a problem with the astronaut ever again. <gasps> no. Fuck. That was Jug. I'm gonna go down. Fuck me. I fucking hate the astronaut. There is nothing good about him. That was my second down. And my third is one that I look at with nothing but pure confusion. I'm in the spawn room after disabling an excavator trying to get a power up to turn into a max ammo. Except I have ammo and like a lot of it. And then I get caught and go down. I have no idea what I was thinking here. And if you thought that down was confusing, the run ender is even stranger. What? What happened exactly? I definitely shot the wave gun at the end there. I got hit once, and I think I saw one more hit after that, and then I just game over. I am gonna have to take that frame by frame in editing to have the slightest clue of understanding what happened there. Ask and you shall receive. This down makes a lot more sense when it slowed down. I took damage next to a wall really quickly, and then the hard cut to that wide shot made it look like I hit a death barrier in real time. When you slow it down, I just got caught at a bad time, and that just happens when you die on moon every time for some reason. I mean, it doesn't happen on other maps, you just kind of go into that downed animation and your hand reaches out, but uh, on moon you get a wide shot. I really have no idea why. This is the only map that does this. Going into Moon, I thought the speed of this strategy would make it too difficult for me to learn quickly, but it actually wasn't hard at all. In fact, only one down was in that room. The other three were poor decisions in the spawn room and the astronaut being the worst enemy in the entire franchise. If I can keep my cool when dealing with the map's frustrating elements, I can definitely reach my next prestige in the next game and maybe even reach round 100. So why did the second attempt end up like this. And this is still not fucking working because it's a well-designed map. I'm going to bed. Fuck it. The problem wasn't RNG. I got the wave gun relatively early on, and while I didn't get Gersh devices until round 21, my luck did manage to get me QEDs and about a dozen ray gun variants, including back-to-back -back Mark II's. Mark II. Bro, what the fuck is my box luck? My box luck is simultaneously really good and really bad. What the f back to back Mark II? Are you serious? Y you see what I mean? <laughs> what are the odds of that? That's so unlikely. This time I was able to find the odds. The odds of pulling a Mark II from the mystery box are between 1 in 5%. On the high end, that means back-to-back -back Mark IIs are about 1 in 400. If the odds are 1%, then the odds are about 1 in 10,000. So that's pretty cool, but not the reason I rage quit. The problem wasn't the astronaut. I did lose Jug on round 44, but I was able to get it back without incident. The problem also was not the excavators. None of them breached throughout the entire playthrough. The problem wasn't with the strategy itself. I didn't take my first down until round 55. When I was able to run the strategy, it worked wonders. But that's kind of the thing. When I was able to run the strategy, it was fine. The problem is that after I finished setting up, for most of the game, I couldn't. The most important part of this strategy is how you give yourself the time and space to hack random power-ups into max ammos. Unless you have an in-plane sight, the only consistent way to get that time and space is to throw a Gersh device. But there's a problem. You have to be extremely close to a power-up to hack it. So close that sometimes I'll just walk into it by accident. The far more frustrating version of this problem, and the reason I get so salty, is that zombies can push you into power-ups. Either because you tried to save a Gersh device and didn't have as much time as you initially thought, or, most annoyingly, because zombies that are affected by a Gersh device still retain their collision. So zombies that, for all intents and purposes, are already dead, can knock you into a power-up and completely destroy your strategy. And to make this even better, this also happens with nukes. Each time you get knocked into a power-up, you lose a Gersh device, possibly two or three if I'm overzealous which I am. And once you run out of Gersh's, 
you're shit out of luck. At that point, you need a natural unhacked max ammo, and if you're out of Gersh's, you're likely also out of wave gun ammo too. The experts of Moon High Rounding can continue training in Tunnel 11 and using Deadwire to hunt for max ammos, but between my lack of experience and Widow's Wine, that was impossible for me. So at that point, I have to move to the infinitely slower casual strategy of training in the Biodome and pray for a max ammo. Sometimes I can get one in the same round. Other times, it takes nearly three full rounds before one spawns, and it can take longer. I went through the trouble of adding a timer for these games, but the amount of real time that passes isn't something I'm concerned about. All I care about is earning as much XP in as few games as possible. Whether those games last 2 or 12 hours doesn't really matter to me. But that doesn't make it any less frustrating, knowing that because enemies that are already dead still have an influence on my movement, I spent the next 15 minutes going through 2 rounds when I could have gone through 10. And when you combine that with the distractions caused by the RNG based setup, the excavators every 3 rounds, the astronaut removing essential perks for multiple rounds at a time, that also caused you to go back to the biodome and play infinitely slower, and everything else, I spent more time dealing with the map's design than playing the game how I wanted to play it. Some of you will argue that this is the skill the map requires. Just like how Zetsubo requires you to foresee problems multiple rounds in advance and prevent them while the early game keeps you on a shoestring budget. Or how Shangri-La requires you to take napalm, shriekers, monkeys, and everything else designed to hurt the player and use them to hurt the zombies. And here's the thing. You're right. Moon is a map that forces you to play its game and win. The problem is that Moon's game isn't what I want to play. And that's how one flawless game at round 54 turns into one down at round 55, another at round 56 trying to turn a double points into that elusive max ammo, followed shortly by this. And this is still not fucking working because it's a well-designed map. I'm going to bed. Fuck it. Despite the rage, I did come back the same night for game 8, mainly because I'm a degenerate. But it didn't go any better. The same problems from the last game continued into this one, fully set up early on, stayed flawless until round 43, downed again on round 45 because sliding is a lie, and after finally recovering I downed again on round 51. But I clutch up, and then I did the smartest thing I did that entire night. Okay, we're there, thank fucking god. I don't have to care about dying anymore. Oh, that was round. Nice. God, do, do I stop? That is my cue to stop. Fuck this map. I said I'd go for round 100 on every map, and that every game I played would be trying to reach round 100, and this game technically still had life, but I didn't. I came away with the prestige, but after all of that, I was done. Moon broke me. I had to wave the white flag. Looking back at the gameplay, I know what my mistakes were, and how I can improve my playing. So mark my words. One day, I will return, and I will have my revenge. After Moon, I needed a map that would lift my spirits. I needed a map that would be an easy win. And while I selected what many in the community would consider the easiest remaining map, it turned out to be equally frustrating. Game Night started the way most games of Dorise and Drax start, turning on the power, buying Juggernog, building the shield, and feeding the three stone dragons to unlock the Wrath of the Ancients. From there, the primary goal is to upgrade the base bow into the lightning bow by shooting three pyres out of the map while running around the entire Undercroft, filling three electric urns with souls to shoot the three prior pyres again, collecting the reforged arrow, and then collecting the lightning bow. Along the way, I took my first down because I didn't realize you can't interact with anything while holding the death machine, but by at that point, all I needed to do was buy my perks, pack a punch my weapons, and build the Ragnarok DG4 Specialist weapon to finish the setup phase and move into the high round strategy. For this strategy, we're going to camp just above Speed Cola and shoot the lightning bow at the bottom of these stairs until the Ragnaroks are fully charged. Once they are, you put them at the bottom of the stairs and it will kill all of the zombies. Once the rags run out, pick them up, shoot the lightning bow, and start the process all over again. I also have a Kuda with turn to help speed things up, as well as the weapon I used my last prestige to. 
token on. The KRM is my Panzer counter, and Double Tap makes the KRM both a Panzer killing machine and makes any death machines I get in the late game strong enough to compete. Conceptually, this strategy is basically identical to Revelations, but a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and the weak link for this strategy might shock you. For high rounding, the Lightning Bow is undeniably the best bow on the map, but there are two things about this bow that bring back all the salt from Moon. The first problem is that if there are too many zombies affected by the Lightning Bow at one time, they can just walk right through the Lightning Bow's area of effect attack like there's nothing there. And with how fast the spawns are in this strategy, this will be a problem throughout the entire run, and there's literally nothing I can do about it. The second problem is that the Lightning Bow's area of effect moves, and it moves a lot. Normally, area of effect weapons affect the area you select. For example, a Molotov cocktail is thrown on the floor and the fire stays put, or the ice staff is shot and the blizzard vortex stays put. The placement of these area of effect attacks is what separates a good player from a bad one, and here I am shooting the lightning bow exactly where I want it to be, and the storm just says, that's nice, and walks away, leaving me exposed. So the lightning bow is an area of effect weapon that A does not deny the area to all enemies, and B leaves the area you want to affect. And that's where the salt comes in. Bro, these, this bow is a piece of shit. Fucking cool. Don't you love it when the lightning bow just doesn't fucking work? It's my favorite. Uh, again, can the game be consistent? Hello, I'm on my hands and knees begging. Excuse me? Hello, lightning bow. Lightning bow, please. I'm begging on my hands and knees for you to do your fucking job. Why does the lightning bow just not kill zombies sometimes? I don't understand. Round 77 is nothing to scoff at. It matches my first game on the giant, and if I didn't have that first down on round 12, this might have gone even farther. Despite the frustration, this run did go well. The next one did not. Fun fact about Dreisendrak, did you know there's absolutely zero indication that the Wonder Sphere is unavailable during the rocket test site until you're trapped inside? I sure did it. Unavailable during test fire. <sighs> that down was entirely avoidable until it wasn't. Wait, where's my... My staff was in my mule kick slot? What the fuck? How? Explain how I just lost the weapon that I've had for the entire game? I need Harvard fucking scientists to analyze what happened in that game. My CUDA was my mule kick weapon for the entire game. It was my mule kick weapon the entire game. I need an explanation. I'm just gonna walk into a fucking ocean. You can add that to the pile of games where I do nothing wrong and get fucked anyway. So, uh, this run went poorly, but thankfully, the next one did not. All of my problems with Dreisendrak's round 100 have been with the Lightning Bow's inability to hold the line, so to mitigate that failing, I decided to swap Mule Kick for Widow's Wine. The downside to this change is that Widow's is only available in the Wonder Fizz machine, and the odds of getting it are on par with getting a Wonder Weapon from the Mystery Box. The upside is that when zombies hit me, they'll be temporarily stunned. This will make holding my position far easier by giving the Lightning Bow more time to kill zombies it's already affecting, and then kill the zombies that are now stunned by Widow's. I'm trading away the easy, consistent early game setup for an easier end game. Well, I would be trading away the easy, consistent early game if I didn't have god tier luck. I'm just gonna try for Widows. I mean, you never know, right? Oh my god! Second hit, no way! This updated strategy took me all the way to round 52 flawlessly before the Panzer caused my first down of the game. Well, I say the Panzer caused it, but really my terrible movement caused it. In either case, I didn't finish recovering before taking a second down a few minutes later, but after that it was smooth sailing until I reached the experience cap for Prestige 4 at the end of round 70. 30 more rounds stood between me and round 100. Unfortunately, I took another down fighting the Panzer because the death array is a lie. Then on round 80, I tried to wish a max ammo into existence instead of using my alchemical and paid the ultimate price.
The rise in Drax started a lot more frustrating than I initially anticipated, but I think I was on the right path by switching Mule Kick for Widows. It's a little surprising to see just how ubiquitous Widows as a perk is. Of course, it's not available on the Giant, but I used it on Origins after digging up the Red Dig sites, on Revelations the Moon straight from the machine, and on Derizon Drac it seemed like the last piece of the puzzle. Perhaps that's our cue to keep dancing with the one that brought us, and play the map where this all started. Shadows of Evil. Beyond being the map that introduced our beloved Widow's Wine, this is my favorite zombies map of all time and one that I've been looking forward to playing this entire time. The setup for this game was just like any other. Pack-a-Punch was opened by round 7 and by round 10 I had the Apothecan Sword Specialist weapon and all three fuses for the Civil Protector. From there, all I needed to do was luck into the remaining Apothecan Servant parts and upgrade the Apothecan Sword by taking another Apothecan Egg from this Ghostly Keeper, place it at four Ritual Sites, and kill the Margwas that spawned. Spawn. Luckily, I happened to get a ray gun from the mystery box earlier in my game, which made these Margwas a complete cakewalk. After completing the first ritual, I also lucked into the Margwa tentacle for the Apothecan Servant, and after completing the third trial, I managed to pull little Arnie's from the mystery box. During the fourth trial, I lucked into Xeno Matter, and after completing that ritual, I upgraded the Apothecan Sword into the Reborn Sword, built the Apothecan Servant, and placed the last Civil Protector Fuse into the Master Switch. And from there, I was ready to start the high round strategy. The fast strategy the strategy for Shadows of Evil is to keep the door from the junction to the waterfront district closed and use the Apothecan Servant, Reborn Sword, and Traps to get through the rounds quickly. The average runtime for this strategy seems to be around 4 hours, but I actually decided to not run this strategy. I had never tried this strategy before, and since I care about the amount of games played more than I care about the amount of actual time it takes, I decided to use the safer, slower strategy that I already know. For this high round, I used the Apothecan Servant at the random perk spot in the Canals District. The spawns here are also very fast, so the Apothecus Servant and Reborn Sword can get a lot of kills per use. I also used my last Prestige token to permanently unlock the Emmet A7 and put Blast Furnace on it for my secondary weapon. If a Margwa spawns, then all I have to do is call in the Civil Protector and watch as he crushes Cthulhu under his iron boot. The Civil Protector is really the MVP of this entire run. Beyond being a hard Margwa counter, he can also kill regular zombies, pick up power-ups, and even revive you if you go down, regardless of whether or not you have Quick Revive. Speaking of perks, I went with Quick Revive and Juggernog for obvious reasons, and I also picked up Widow's Wine for the extra protection. Oh, uh, wait, hold on, I'm getting a message. Fourth perk? What do you mean, fourth perk? Oh, right, so I didn't really know what I wanted for my fourth perk in this game. Double Tap would have been really helpful for death machines, but it's a pretty marginal benefit at best. Speed Cola is a nice quality of life benefit, but the m 7 already has the Fast Mags attachment, and I have more than enough time to reload the Apothecan Servant while it does its thing. Mule Kick is an option, but between the Apothecan Servant, the Reborn Sword, and the Civil Protector, there's not really a massive need for another alternate ammo type. And the whole area is so small that I don't think Stamina Up is really going to be the most beneficial. Thing. So when it came time to decide on my fourth perk, it was round 30, and I went like, uh... And then it was round 50, and I was like, uh... And then it was round 71, and I went like, uh... And then it was round 81, and I went like... Hang on, you know what I just realized? I've been using regular Arnie's this entire time. You know what would really fucking help with ammo conservation? If I had the upgrade. Oh, yeah, shit, the little Arnie's, they have an upgrade. There are two simple steps to upgrade the little Arnie's. The first is that you need to get 100 kills with little Arnie's, which, uh, yeah, it's round 81, I say we've done that already. The second is to throw away a little Arnie at three separate locations around the map. Once both of these are done, you can come back to the burlesque, throw a little Arnie at the ritual site, and enjoy a little show. We're gonna throw this down. Yeah, there we go. Look at these little goopers. Uh, hi. I need you to move. With that done, I finally decided to just go ahead and buy the perk I'd been standing next to for hours, and I was finally set up on round 82. Something I have to mention is that the only reason I'm on round 82 is because of the Civil Protector. I mentioned earlier that he can revive you if you go down, and he has been doing that this entire time. Currently, I am sitting at 5 downs, with the 6 coming only a few minutes after buying Speed Cola. If I was limited to the amount of quick revives I had, this run would have ended a long time ago. But thanks to the Civil Protector, I can continue. There are another 18 rounds between me and round 100. All that's left to do is grind. If I'm gonna have to rely on AATs for an extended period of time, I think it might be best for me to drop Speed Cola and go for Mule Kick. Oh, 
Oh my. The spawns! Oh my. Do I have any quick revives left? I don't. Wow. Oh my god, I got dropped. I'm dead. I'm dead. No, I, I, was, I was spamming right trigger. I was spamming right trigger. It did not work. Let's fucking go. Oh my god, it's been so long. Wow, that was the longest, messiest 18 rounds of zombies I've ever played. But I did it. Well, almost. I'm still three and a half levels away from the experience cap. My best guess for how this happened is that the Silver Protector doesn't earn any XP for the player, and he was getting a ton of kills this entire time. And that leaves me in a tough spot. On the one hand, I could get more kills for myself without the Silver Protector on the map and finish the prestige a little faster, but on the other hand, I'm completely out of quick revives, and if I die without the Silver Protector on the map, it is game over. I originally decided on this strategy to get to round 100 because it was the slower but ultimate ultimately safer option. So to finish Prestige 5, I continued dancing with the one that brought us, and it worked. Six rounds and one extra down later, it was over. After eight hours of gameplay, I was exhausted. More importantly, I was only halfway there. I always think of Garad Krovi as a simple map, but there's actually a ton of stuff I need to get for this run. In total, I need the Raygun Mark III, the Specialist Weapon, the Mangler Mask, the Dragon Strike in its upgrade, the Shield in its upgrade, as well as Monkey Bombs and its upgrade. Unlocking all of that is a very messy process, so rather than going through the game round by round, I'm going to explain how I got everything I needed for the setup. Getting the Reagan Mark III is as straightforward as they come, just spin the mystery box until you get lucky. Monkey Bombs are also something you're going to need out of the box, but the upgrade is a little more involved. You need to find a vase with flowers somewhere on the map and interact to pick it up. Then find an unlit candle, shoot it with your shield to light the wick, and then interact to pick it up. Then after killing about a dozen zombies with monkey bombs, a blue flask will drop that you also need to pick up. From there you need to throw a monkey bomb at the grave where your trials are, look up at this green flame, interact with it, and then you can pick up the upgraded monkey bomb. The upgraded monkeys will instantly kill any zombie that it touches, and the explosion deals way more damage to anything left behind. It's not essential for the strategy, but it's nice to have if you happen to get monkeys out of the box. The Dragon Strike is also unessential, but nice to have. Getting the Dragon Strike is simple, just do the lockdown in the hatchery and you're all set, and upgrading it is just as easy. All you need to do is get enough kills with it and then hit an Iron Cross flag outside the map with the Dragon Strike. Once those two things are done, you can repeat the lockdown at the hatchery, and if you get enough kills with the Dragon Strike during the lockdown, you can pick up the Draconite Strike. The upgraded Dragon Strike does more damage and has a larger radius, but the most important part of the upgrade is that you get an extra charge. Both versions of the Dragon Strike will distract zombies, so while you can't use both charges at the same time, the extra charge will make recovering from downs a lot safer. It's a bit like having two extra monkey bombs in that sense, and that's really what we're going to be using it for in this strategy. But preventing downs is a lot better than recovering from downs, and that's where the upgraded shield comes in. Getting the regular shield is finding three parts around the map like any other shield in zombies, but the upgrade is is also a little more involved. After killing around 50 zombies with a shield, you need to go to three separate areas and shoot this glowing keeper riding with the shield's fire attack. After that, you need to use the shield to absorb fire damage from the dragons that periodically burn the map, and once all of that is done, you can walk up to the dead dragon in the spawn room and interact with it to upgrade your shield. The upgraded shield doesn't get any additional offensive capabilities since the regular shield is already infinite damage, but the defenses are improved significantly. It goes from 15 hits of health to 30 for an 133% increase in durability. It's an incredible improvement for not a lot of work, but the same can't be said for the Gauntlet of Siegfried. This quest corresponds to the bottom symbol of the Trial Gravestone and starts with picking up the Dragon Egg in the hatchery and then bathing it in the same Dragonfire from the Shield upgrade. From there you have to kill zombies that the 
dragon is lit on fire and then get penetrating multi kills and then get melee kills. From there, you need to take the dragon egg back to the hatchery and place it inside this incubator here to start another lockdown. Once that's done, you need to wait for the dragon egg to cool, and once it's done cooling, you can pick up the egg, return to the gravestone, and interact with the bottom symbol to pick up the Gauntlet of Siegfried. Last but not least is the Mangler Mask, which increases damage dealt to manglers by 30% and reduces damage taken by manglers by 50%. And all you have to do is shoot the helmets off 5 Russian manglers and then destroy the arm cannon on another 5 Russian manglers. Once that's done, the Mangler Mask will spawn on this mannequin in the department store. This one is really easy to earn. So you might be wondering, why did it take me 2 hours and 45 rounds to finally unlock? Guides for zombies have always been shall we say, inconsistent. This is something a lot of Zombies players are aware of, but I didn't realize just how bad they could be until now. The worst defender for bad Garad Krovi guides was by far the Mangler Mask. Every video guide I found said that I only needed to shoot 5 Mangler helmets, and said literally nothing about destroying the arm cannons. It was only after referencing the Call of Duty wiki that I learned that I was missing literally half the information I needed. And since Manglers on Garad Krovi are straight up broken, the Mangler Mask is an essential part of this strategy. In fact, my first two downs in this game were the result of Mangler cannon shots that have so much bullet magnetism that they can basically make perfect right angles. So that 50% damage reduction is pretty much essential for literally every game of Garad Krovi you will ever play. I haven't played the map in a long time and forgot how to unlock it, and the guides failed me. The devil is in the details, and right now these guides are about as devilish as the Pope. By the time I actually unlocked the Mangler Mask, I had already downed to three times, and my fourth down came when I forgot the Gauntlet of Siegfried starts with the completely useless flamethrower instead of the melee version everyone actually uses. This down was ultimately my own fault, but the chances of actually making it to round 100 and reaching the experience cap were dead long before that actually happened. But after playing that game and wasting three hours of my time to learn what the guides got wrong, I can move on to game 14 and try again. Having correct information at the start of the game is the difference between being set up on round 45 and 23. There was an unfortunate down during this game because my bullets are a lie, but other than that the setup went about as smoothly as it could possibly go. Garod Krovi has a very unique high round strategy because the way you get through the rounds is actually by using the shield. The shield's fire blast does infinite damage in both its upgraded and base form, and you can get more ammo for it by simply breaking it and picking up a new one for absolutely nothing. Because we need access to the shield in a place with fast spawns, we're training in the operations bunker with both doors closed, and all we need to do is spam the Shield Blast and the Gauntlet of Siegfried whenever we have it. The Mark III's damage drops off in the 50s, but we'll still use it often for the stun effect to make shield pickups a lot safer. And for my other weapons, I have an M8A7 with Turned and a Vesper with Deadwire. The M8A7 is still kitted out from Shadows of Evil, and I used my last Prestige token to permanently unlock the Vesper, so it also has a full set of attachments. There are two alterations I made to this high round strategy. The first is that I'm not running the Electric Trap next to the Time Trials melee wall by because traps won't give me any XP. The second and far more impactful change is my perk loadout. Garad Krovi High Rounders are also Garad Krovi Easter Egg Speedrunners. When you complete the Garad Krovi Easter Egg in under 90 minutes, you are rewarded with a permanent perkaholic for the rest of that game. This also removes the perk limit entirely, so recovering after a down is as simple as using the Wonder Fizz a single time for a guaranteed quick revive. The reason I'm not doing this is because I've never done the Garad Krovi Easter Egg, or any pre-Cold War Easter Egg for that matter. So the odds of me being able to complete the easter egg in under 90 minutes on my first try are basically zero. I'd probably game over before even completing the easter egg at all, which, you know, not what I'm going for. Speaking of going down, my second down of the game came on around 30 because I tried to train my way out of a problem instead of using the death machine I risked my life for. Unfortunately, that means I lost the free stamina perk I got from the trials, but it's not a big deal. Going down trying to get power-ups is surely something I won't do again. Why am I like this? My last down was at least something different. I was running alternate ammo types for a second because my shield was out of ammo, and instead of using the Mark III to slow them down, I decided to try and get a shield quickly, but you really have to be looking at the shield to pick it up, so I miss it, and without the additional health, it was game over. Somehow with a better setup, I reached a lower round than I did with my worst setup, but the next game is where I would finally put it all together. This game started out with 57 rounds of flawless gameplay over nearly 3 hours. 
this. It's definitely one of the strongest starts to a Zombies game I can remember, and definitely my best performance on Garod Krovi of all time. The flawless streak ended because I hit the wrong zombie while trying to break my shield, which led to a zombie getting behind me, trapping me, and slowly killing me while I couldn't do anything. Where that death came slowly, my second down came insanely quickly. The time between the first and last hit was a full 28 frames. Not exactly a whole lot of time to react to that one, hard to blame myself for that one, but very easy to blame myself for my third down. I saw a group of zombies coming from in front, but for some reason decided to try and double back? Mind you, I could have slipped outside by simply turning left, but instead I made one of the most inexplicable decisions of all time. That cold streak put me on round 65 with no quick revives and one more level to go. At this point, the most amount of games it's taken me to prestige is 3. Failing here not only means adding another game of Garod Krovi, but it means Garod Krovi would be my worst outing so far. But this time, success or failure is entirely in my hands. Does that kill any of them? Wow, it is purely distraction. I did not expect that. Oh, there's 35. Please, for the love of God, just <laughs> let me get through this safely. We're not quite there. Probably going to be a 68, I assume. Oh my god, that's round. Okay. Do I dare? Let's go! Oh my god, what a relief. What a relief. If this was a four gamer, I just, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. It wasn't pretty, but Prestige 6 is done. Round 68 would end up being a Valkyrie round, and beating that short round ties Garad with Moon for my lowest PB in the challenge so far, but it wouldn't get much better. This game ends on round 70 after a Valkyrie blocks my view, I shoot it and run through the explosion not knowing there's a horde of zombies directly behind it, and that went about as well as you would expect. So while it's not round 100, Prestige 6 is finally done. And for number 7, we'll stay in the Soviet Union. 900 miles east, our next adventure awaits in beautiful black and white. Ascension's high round setup is everything you need to get in a casual game. Power, pack a punch, perks, and power weapons. On round 6, the power was on, and by round 14 I had both the Thunder Gun and Gersh devices, and launched the rocket to gain access to the pack a punch machine. Then there's the perks, which, uh, included an error. Oh, they got through, fuck me. No, I lost Quick Revive. I thought I got them all. Where did they go? Fuck, man, that's such a critical error. So unnecessary. God damn it. Well, there they go again. For those who don't know, the Space Monkeys are Ascension's boss round. These guys are interesting because rather than attacking the player, they will first instead go after their perks. It's hard to defend multiple perks in a solo game. What you typically do is leave the door between Juggernog and the central building closed so you can defend Quick Revive and Juggernog at the same time, and just hope that the monkeys don't attack your other perks. After killing all the monkeys that came my way, I decided to cheat for offense and go after the monkeys attacking Widow's Wine. Somehow one of them got behind me and that resulted in losing both Widow's Wine and Quick Revive. Losing Widow's Wine is an expensive but ultimately minor mistake. Losing Quick Revive is devastating. You can only buy Quick Revive three times per game, and despite not going down, this mistake means I have to use another Quick Revive. In other words, this mistake is as punishing as going down, and was entirely avoidable. Even if this play went perfectly, what did I even accomplish? Saving 4,000 points when I was mostly already set up? Saving like a minute or two of time when I was already in for a multi-hour game? This was an all-time bad decision in a game with such high stakes, so naturally, it's one that I had to make. After rebuying my lost perks, I went ahead and pack a punch to my Thunder Gun sidekick. While the RK5 may seem like an odd choice, it was the obvious choice for Ascension. My main strategy will need a lightweight weapon for movement, and my backup strategy is in the spawn room, so ammo runs will be extremely easy. Attachments are a big quality of life boost for this game, but the RK5 is also a great early game weapon that I can use in my future games for Prestige 8, 9, and 10. All in all, a very obvious choice for the next weapon to use my Prestige token on. But let's stay focused on Prestige 7 and talk about the two strategies I have for this game. 
The main strategy is to train in the power room with Fedora to meal kick close. This area has insanely fast spawns, and enough Thundergun and Gersh spam will have you flying through the rounds. This game was my first time trying this strategy, and I went down pretty early on while trying to learn it. That spooked me off the main strategy, so for a few rounds I switched to the backup strategy, which is training in the spawn room and using dead wire on the RK5 to get through the rounds. But I wasn't going to be spooked for the entire game, so on round 35 I rebought Widow's Wine and returned to the main high round strategy. Widow's Wine once again seems to be the key piece for me. That first down wouldn't have happened if I had Widow's Wine, and it'll protect me throughout the rest of my game. And I'm sure some of you are looking at the rest of my perks and thinking, Dork, surely you're not gonna play most of this game with only three perks again while you decide on a fourth, right? <laughs> <clears throat> In my defense, I wanted to earn enough points to rebuy Widows and Speed Cola every few rounds without going bankrupt. Despite being a little scary early in the game, the main strategy ended up being really fast and really fun. I ended up getting all the way to round 83 before my inexperience with this high round came into play. I was going through the rounds quickly, but my thunder gun usage was far from optimal. That combined with only having one ammo resupply and gobble gum led to me running out of ammo and going down on round 83. This is only my second down of the game, but because I lost quick revive to the space monkeys early on, I am completely out of quick revives and end up grabbing mule kick as a replacement. Placement. For my mule kick weapon, I decided to get a kudo with turned and start incorporating the backup strategy. At this point, I'm training in the spawn room with my two AAT weapons when my thunder gun is out of ammo, and whenever I get a max ammo or an alchemical, I return to the power room for a few minutes of speed running. This was the best compromise between safety and speed. But you may have noticed by now, the longer these games go on, the more mistakes I tend to make. That was no different here. No! Fuck! Oh, I trained so poorly and couldn't swap to the Thunder Gun in time. God damn it. This sucks so much. Probably the worst movement in any game I've ever played. I'm a little embarrassed to even show it on YouTube, but despite being such an avoidable down, and despite being the game ender, it's not the mistake I think of when looking back on this run. This was a bet I made a long, long time ago. This game ended three rounds away from 100 on three downs. The fourth down never came to be and it's all my fault. I made this bet on round 16, and I lie in it on round 97. It hurts. It really fucking hurts. And it's gonna hurt for a while longer. Game 16 ended just shy of level 32, and I'm gonna be honest, I'm in no shape to try again. Round 100 is not a goal for this game. All I am here to do is finish Prestige 7 and level up as many weapons as I can. By round 17, I finally finished the last couple levels on the ICR. 70 minutes later, I reached the experience cap for Prestige 7. That was on round 45. On round 46, I finished leveling up the VMP, finished the round, and end of the game. It took 47 rounds to gain the last four levels, and all 106 minutes were spent thinking about one thing. The bet I made, and the bet I lied in. Prestige 8 started out unlucky. The high round strategy for Kino only requires perks, pack a punch, and the thunder gun. Getting the first two are easy, but it was only a matter of time before the god tier box luck I've been getting finally regressed to the mean. And, well, yep, there's there's a down. Like, what the fuck am I even supposed to do? I've spent every dollar I've made on the box, and I've gotten nothing I need. This is game over. This is game over right here. Yeah, like, what the fuck? What was I supposed to do? I did everything right, and the box said LOL no, so that was the run. Sometimes RNG just gets you. I spent every dollar I earned on box spins. There was nothing I could do about this one. But the next one... The box lock returned in full force this time, with monkey bombs on round 5 and a thunder gun on round 13. That luck didn't extend to my survival because on round 15 I learned that anywhere but here is a lie, 
What? But that aside, I was ready to start the high round strategy on round 25. The fastest way to play Kino is by training in the alleyway with the Thunder Gun, just like how I trained in the Power Room on Ascension. Enough Thunder Gun spam will get you through the rounds quickly, and there are more than enough max ammos and alchemicals to keep you going. That last game of grinding weapon levels on Ascension really did help out here, because now I can use my last prestige token to permanently unlock the VMP and run it with Deadwire when I run out of Thunder Gun ammo. The overarching strategy is very similar to Ascension, just remove the space monkeys from the equation and replace play Skirsh devices for regular old monkey bombs, and you've basically got the gist of it. That might be why my first game of alley training went about as well as it did. I made it all the way to round 60 without another down, and this one is pretty dubious. What? I'm gonna need hardware scientists to explain how I died there. We've counted frames on a few of these downs before, but this one is far and away the fastest. In fact, it quite literally can't get any faster. Ignoring the hit that set off Widow's Y, the time between the next hit and the one that killed me doesn't actually exist. Ignoring one-hit kill attacks, this is the first and only time I can recall being one-framed in this or any other game of zombies. The third down was the only normal down of the game. I tried running through a gap instead of shooting, and it didn't work out. The fourth down could have also been stopped by using the Thunder Gun, I got a Death Machine power-up while spamming the Thunder Gun with Alchemical, and I wanted to save as much new Thunder Gun ammo as possible, so I went for the Death Machine earlier than I should have, and that was game over. Throughout this entire game, I was shocked with just how natural this strategy felt. Had it not been for a couple of unlucky moments, this run might have gone all the way. But, bad pennies always turn up and game 20 would be no different. Game 20 starts out with something we haven't seen before, something so unremarkable I guarantee nobody watching will even notice. Did you catch it? After 20 games, we are, for the first time, playing as Tank Dempsey. Dempsey isn't available on Shadows of Evil, and the Chronicles version of Moon will always spawn Player 1 as Richtofen for the Easter Egg. The odds of spawning as any of the four characters are 1 in 4, so the odds of not spawning in as Tank are 75% for the first game. That quickly dwindles to 56% for the second game, 42% for the third, 31% for the fourth, 24% for the fifth game, and continues dropping until we get to game 15 where the odds are just a hair over 1%. And when you add in the of spawning into this game of Kino as tank, the odds fall to 0.3%. Those aren't the craziest odds in the world. The back-to-back -back Mark IIs on Moon from earlier were 0.01%. I just thought it was neat. But speaking of wonder weapons, I pulled the Thunder Gun on round 6 from my very first box location, and after that decided to stop spinning the box to avoid adding fire sails into the drop rotation. Unfortunately, that means no monkey bombs for this game, but the additional max ammos are worth it. The high rounding starts on round 19 this time, and I make it all the way to round 57 before some bad target selection causes my first down. But everything goes smoothly from there, and at the start of round 78, I reach the experience cap for prestige. Eight. All that's left to do now is try and hit round 100. Hitting the experience cap means that I can start using traps to help speed up the game, and the fire trap will help speed things up significantly. I don't use the fire trap often since I don't often play on this side of the map, and uh, do you remember what I said about bad pennies? What? Holy shit, you cannot run through that trap. That is different from literally every other trap in this series. Uh, huh. So it turns out you can't run through the fire trap. You can run through pretty much every other trap so long as you have Juggernog, but not this one apparently. Not a whole lot I could have done without knowing that. Speaking of things I can't do a whole lot about, do you remember what I said about bad pennies? Okay, that was an un <laughs> that was an unlucky spawn. Holy. That is the most dangerous spawn location in this area, but having a zombie spawn at that exact time at that exact location to drop down and perfectly block my path with pixel precision, sometimes all you can do is laugh. At the end of round 84, I decide to swap out a VMP for a KN44 to try and use the last 15 rounds to gain some additional weapon levels. For high rounding, that's obviously a bad decision. In the context of a greater challenge, it did make some sense, but it didn't end up mattering. A few minutes later, I tried to squeeze through a gap, failed, and was late with a thunder gun shot. Round 85, game over. 
I may not have made it to round 100, but terrible RNG aside, this was the most fun I've had high rounding since Revelations. Ascension was fun but got spoiled by two major mistakes, Garrod Krovi was hurt by bad guides, the Shadows of Evil run was fun but got exhausting at the end, the Lightning Bone made Dorizendrak frustrating, and, well, you already know how I feel about Moon. Something about Kino just clicked with me, and these two games will probably change the way I play this map in the future. Part of that is the undeniable speed of trading in the alley. The stage is iconic, but it's about as fast as 5 o'clock traffic. Two hours on the stage is usually enough to get me to round 40, but in my last game that got me to the mid-60s. The other big advantage is that Nova Crawlers don't spawn in the alleyway. I didn't mention this when going over the strategy, but it's something you might have noticed while watching the gameplay. I detest Nova Crawlers along with just about everyone else, and knowing I can avoid them and speed up the game by changing strategies is very appealing. You are mostly limited to the Thunder Gun with this strategy, which is something I don't really like, but the trade-off might just be worth it. This challenge might have changed how I play future games Akino, and it's going to change how I play Zetsubo too. The Zetsubo early game is one of the toughest in the entire franchise. I need to make progress towards both the Skull of non Stopway Specialist weapon and the KT4 Wonder weapon, as well as collect parts for the Shield and Gas Mask. On top of that, I need to remain strong enough to deal with Thrashers that can spawn on basically any round, and at the same time be weak enough to maximize my point earning potential for one of the most expensive maps in the franchise. It's a balancing act that can bring some of the best players to their knees, but it's also one that can be solved with one box hit. You know, I'm, I'm gonna hit the box. We don't need to for this, but I just want a gun and, I don't know, humor me. <laughs> I got the ray gun, wow. Say what you will about the Black Ops 3 ray gun, but at this stage of the game, it is a godsend to deal with those early game thrashers. The first 20 rounds of every Zetsubo game are basically a collectathon, and this collectathon went pretty well. By the end of round 3, I had two skulls for the skull of Nasapwe, and by round 6, the power was on and I had my first part to unlock Pack a Punch. By round 8, I had another skull for the skull of Nasapwe, completed two of my free trials, and had all the buildable parts for the shield and gas mask. On round 9, I had cleansed the last skull, and by round Round 10 I had the Skull of the Subway, as well as the final two parts for Pack-a-Punch and the underwater plants for the KT-4. A round later I had the second part for the KT-4, and the round after that I had my final KT-4 part. I went down to the bottom of the bunker to build the KT-4 at what I thought was the end of round 13, and... and there we go- oh! Wow, I just got destroyed. Ah, you're why, yes. Yeah, it was only a matter of time before a thrasher got me. One unfortunate down later and I could start working towards the upgraded KT4, aka the Masamune. The first part of the Masamune can be earned after defeating the giant spider boss fight. I started this boss fight after round 13 ended and took my second down because I went in underpowered, but eventually I defeated the boss and picked up the tooth and a free widow's wine. The other two parts for the Masamune require a lot of round skipping, so on round 17 I was finally ready to collect the second part for the Masamune. Uh... What? Did my game crash? Oh, good. I'm honestly surprised this didn't happen sooner. In case any of you are wondering, you keep all the stats and XP you earned in games where the servers crash. So this game does unfortunately add one to our total. There's nothing I can do about that. All I can do now is start a new game and hope for better luck. Oh hey, look who it is. The Zetsubo early game doesn't change much between games, so for the sake of time, let's pick up where we left off. On round 11, I picked up the KT4 and defeated the giant spider all without going down. From there, all I had to do was vaporize this wall with the skull of an Asapwe and use the rainbow water I got from this fast travel spot to water an underwater plant three times. You can only water this plant once a round, so by round 16, I was able to water the plant enough times to pick it up. The last part for the Masamune requires you to complete all three of your tribes. My first trial was to destroy 5 webs with explosions, and my second was to kill 20 zombies while underwater. Those are both incredibly easy challenges, but my third was one of the hardest challenges you can get. I had to kill 3 zombies while they were mutating into thrashers, which ultimately comes down to luck. 
for this to work, I need to see a zombie near a spore, see that spore pop, and see the zombie start to be pulled underground. From there, I have less than a second to kill that zombie before it's pulled all the way underground, and if I fail, I not only don't progress to the trial, but I now also have a thrasher to deal with. The trials in every game are completely random, so most high round and easter egg attempts will reset if the trials are too difficult, but because I'm trying to keep the amount of games played as low as possible, this isn't an option for me. So at the end of each round, I had to guide zombies around the map looking for spores and hope that I both had the firepower and reaction time to kill a mutating zombie quickly, and hope that zombie would even mutate in the first place because it isn't guaranteed to happen. It took until round 21 to finally happen, but after an extremely slow and tedious process, I finally completed completed the last trial. From there, all I had to do was return to the trial area and pull out my shield. Once I had my shield out, I needed to wait for lightning to strike and send the electric current into my shield. Then I need to take the electrified shield to this cage, melee the control panel, and step inside the cage. From there, I will be lowered beneath the ground and can pick up the final part tucked away into this surplus spirit Halloween skeleton. With all three Masamune parts, I can return to the end of the bunker, craft the upgraded KT4, and finally start the high round strategy. The high round strategy a lot of people are familiar with requires you to complete the easter egg and camp at the bottom of the elevator shaft with the Masamune. However, just like Arad Krovi, I'm not doing that because I've never done any pre-Cold War easter eggs, and that's okay because there's actually a faster strategy we can use instead. The fast high round strategy is training in the underground skull of non stopway room. The best high rounders will use three alternate ammo types for this strategy, but I modified the strategy slightly. I'll be shooting a Masamune shot at the floor of the stairs that will kill a number of spawning zombies, as well as the zombies I'll be training. As I'm doing that, I'll also be using the M887 with turned and the ICR with deadwire, which I had just permanently unlocked with my last prestige token. I'll also be using the Skull of Nasapwe to kill zombies once it's charged, but it's primarily there to counter thrashers. This looks like a dangerous strategy because all the zombies that spawn in this room are risers, and if you don't know what you're doing, it's really easy to get caught when a zombie spawns. But if you hug the walls tightly, you'll be able to slip by them every time. In fact, the first time I got caught while running this strategy was all the way around 60 when I just wasn't paying enough attention. But that was actually my third down of the game. The first two came a little earlier. My first down was all the way back on round 47. I thought the round was over and was going to buy ammo for my ICR, but then I saw a zombie spawn, realized the round was still going, and died trying to switch back. It was a very dumb mistake on my part, and my second down was even dumber, but less of my fault. On round 52, an explosion happened in front of me, and it just so happened to perfectly hide these zombies who instantly caught and killed me. It was very similar to my last down on Garad Krovi, and in both cases there wasn't a whole lot I could do. As we talked about, my third down was just me not paying attention, and my fourth down was much the same. I got forced outside on round 61, rounded up all the zombies and came back thinking all the zombies would still be following me down the stairs, and I was very wrong. That was game over after four downs, but there was actually something that could have extended this run significantly that I completely forgot about until game 23. The setup phase for this game went exactly the same as the last two games, but there was one more added piece to the puzzle. If you plant a seed and shoot it with a Masamune once every three rounds, there's a 1 in 3 chance to grow an imprint plant. When you interact with an imprint plant, you basically create a clone of your character. So if you make one of these plants lose all your quick revives and go down, instead of your game ending, your character will die and another version of you will respawn from one of the plants with all of your gear. It's kind of like the time bomb from Buried, except you don't have to go back in the rounds and and you can have 3 or 4 of these on the map at any given time. This is how you can go down more than 4 times in a solo game without the game ending. I managed to return to round 61 in my next game without going down, but oh boy would I be needing those imprint plants. By round 88, I had gone down 10 times and used up all 4 of my imprint plants. All I had was quick revive in a dream. That dream soon became a nightmare. We're close, but we're not there yet. We are close. One more round ought to do it. God damn it. All right. We still have a life here, but we have no imprint plants. We have to be careful. Oh no. That was an avoidable down. I don't know if I made it all the way to the end of 35. Oh no.
The round 100 dream is dead, but there's still hope. I made it fairly deep into round 88, and between the prior two games, I might have earned enough experience to prestige. But I don't know. You and I are both spectators now. All we can do is hope. We're watching it live together. I have no idea if I made it. I'm gonna be so crushed if I have to play another game and get like a kill. All right, we're getting close here. Moment of truth. Please, I please tell me I got enough. No, we're so close. We're so close. 11,175 experience is what did me in. What does that equate to? About 160 kills over 10 rounds. The fourth game of Zetsubo, the final of this prestige, was over in 14 minutes. This game was so unnecessary. The crash on the first game certainly didn't help, but taking advantage of imprint plants in the second would have made a bigger impact. Hell, that could have been around 100 game if I played my cards right. And it's not like my performance in the third game was all that strong, especially in the second half. Regardless, no matter how you try and look at it, Zetsubo is the first map to take four games to prestige. Don't worry, it won't be alone for long. I really wasn't looking forward to this. That isn't a commentary on Shangri-La. I love this map. It's a tight, difficult map, but it's not without ways to survive. Everything the map throws at you can not only be combated, but can even be turned back on the map itself. Well, everything except for that goddamn sand trap that serves no purpose other than randomizing your movement. Shangri-La is a map that I love, but it's a difficult map in every sense of the word. I don't like to say video games are objectively anything, but if you took a community-wide poll on what maps are the most difficult and aggregated the results, Shangri-La would be near the top if not number one. It was for that reason I wasn't looking forward to this one, but that led to the best decision I made throughout this entire challenge. I said, you know what? Fuck it. Shangri-La is a hard map, and nobody would reasonably expect anyone to make it to round 100 on their first try, or even their first dozen tries. That's not to say I wasn't trying to make it to round 100. I wanted to complete the challenge in as few games as possible. I simply wasn't going to beat myself up if I didn't. For the first time in a month, I allowed myself to fail. And I did miserably, but that failure led to the most fun I had throughout this entire challenge. Yo, oh my god, it's Quick Revive. No fucking way. I got so lucky. Before we go any further, let's talk about the extent of that failure. My first game ended on round 17. It was another crash. The second ended on round 35, the third ended on round 38, the fourth ended on round 45, and the fifth on round 50. That was a nice round number to end the steady march upward on, as the sixth game ended on round 40, the seventh ended on round 31, and the eighth on round 34. The ninth game, yes, ninth game, ended on round 25 when I finally earned enough experience to prestige. Once you reach the experience cap for prestige 10 and leave the game, there are no rewards. No achievements or fancy animations to trigger an artificial dopamine response, just a banner message congratulating you and an orange level 36 next to your name. The game didn't care. The people in your next public match probably won't care. Your friends may congratulate you, but if you don't mention it to them, they may not even notice. The only person who cares is the only person who should. You. And it's now, after 86 minutes of prelude, that we finally get to the point. Some of you are wondering why I would attempt Shangri-La at all when I could play nothing but Revelations for every prestige, or why I limited myself to one map per prestige in the first place. I do have to admit that it's partially a desire to make good videos. Believe me, you, you don't want to watch me play Revelations 11 times. That doesn't make for good content. Playing a different map for each prestige makes for a better video, and ultimately, it's more fun for me to play. Sampling every map's high round meta is a lot more fun than grinding one map, and that is and always will be what's important. If you're playing video games for any reason other than having fun, you're an astronaut who brought your wallet. With enough time, anyone of any skill level or any background can reach Prestige Master in this game. It's not a skill check, nor is it shrouded in mystery like Black Ops 2's ranking system. The end goal isn't inherently interesting, but the journey is. This was mine, and throughout its highs and its lows, 
I don't regret a goddamn second of it. If you don't learn to set the destination aside and enjoy the journey for the journey's sake, you'll only live a fraction of the life you could. Not all of those who wander are lost. Some of us are exactly where we need to be. And yet, there's still more to do. After reaching level 36, there are still 964 levels to go before reaching level 1000. The journey isn't over, but this chapter is. And when it's time to start that next chapter, I hope you'll be there.